Do you not think that there are things which you can understand, and yet which are, that some people see things that others cannot? But there are things old and new, which must not be contemplated by men's eyes, because they know, or think they know, some things which other men have told them. Ah, it is the fault of our science that it wants to explain all, and if it explain not, then it says there is nothing to explain. Quote by Abraham von Helsing and Dracula by Bram Stoker. Hello, and welcome to the Midnight Gala, a Hunter the Reckoning 5th edition one-shot, running tonight for your viewing pleasure and as a fundraising effort to benefit Love Your Rebellion, a non-profit supporting people of all marginalized identities through the arts. I am Rachel, also called Stolen Fires, pretty much everywhere on the internet, and I will be your storyteller this evening. Before we proceed, Hunter is a game about fighting monsters. The bad guys are really, really bad, and hunters sometimes have to be worse to win. This story includes depictions of violence, exploitation, abuse, and possibly harm against innocent adults. Viewer discretion is advised. We'll also be using the X-Card safety tool. If any scene is getting too intense for any reason, please use one of the X cards provided in either the Discord or the Roll20. Hold your hands up or just say X card and the scene will stop. Here at Vorpal Tales, we believe players always come first. To find out what we're running for the rest of this two-week fundraiser, or what we will be running later on in the year, check out the calendar on VorpalTales.com. You can also find us on Discord and most social media outlets including YouTube, where you can find a library of our past shows, and eventually this show itself on Video On Demand. A very special thanks to Dark Somnia Music, Safik, Travis Savoy, Epidemic Sound, Aimed to Head Official, Helmgast, Free League, and Eldritch Echoes for providing all the music you'll hear either tonight or as the shows progress. Thanks also as well to Roll20 for providing an excellent virtual tabletop for us to run these events easily. And last but not least, thank you to our fans who have already generously supported this fundraiser. Our next milestone is $500, at which point few four viewers will get to play in a short campaign run by our very own Zach Rules, and one more viewer will receive two copies of the Love Your Rebellion zine. At a thousand dollars, Mare will draw random viewers into her own channel to hang out while she plays cozy comfort games. One random viewer will also receive a two-year Patreon subscription. This means you will receive not only access to special shows such as Wilds Beyond the Witchlight or Horror on the Orient Express, but you'll also be able to hang out in the Zoom chat as we record. Lastly, at the end of tonight, one participant in chat will receive a free copy of Vason, a dark fantasy game that's also a little about hunting monsters. So, without further ado, let's introduce our players. Please tell us who you are, where we can find you on the internet, and something about the character you are playing tonight. Hey guys, I'm Alan, your Eldritch Keeper. You can find me on Twitter and Twitch as the Eldritch Keeper. And today I shall be playing Carl Atkins, the hospital security guard, who is really just there for his friends. Hello, everybody. I'm Harry, aka Slibricat, and today I will be playing William. Let me get the last name right because I forgot it. Um, <laughs> I'm on not much sleep. Uh, William Nazarian. The Tech Geek. Hi, everybody. Kitty Kimchi here. You can find me on Twitter at Yep, She's Blasian. And today I'm playing Jillian White Pants, journalist who knows all your secrets. Hey there, I'm Pam. And uh, you can find me on various social medias at Vepel. And today I am playing Dr. Nazarin Sultani, emergency room doctor, and possibly a little bit too overconfident in her own abilities with medicine, but aware that something's not right. Hello, I am Rosie. You can find me on Twitter at mom underscore sized or as odd duck dice. 
and tonight I will be playing for you Mandy Clements. She's here as a caterer, and uh, she's she might break down a door or two looking at the sheet. We'll see. See where the night takes us. I am at House Tremere. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at House Tremere. Uh, today I will be playing Luke Aronson, a minor celebrity who likes to party and have a good time. Saw some things that no one should see. Excellent. Thank you so much. So, Lovey Rebellion's mission is to empower marginalized groups in the arts. At least 80% of musical acts hired to perform at LYR events, artists, or writers that are published in the LYR magazine, or whose works appear in the LYR zine, self-identify as women, immigrants, people of color, people from queer and trans communities, people from low-income communities, and or people with disabilities. LYR produces several arts programs in addition to the LYR Zine and Babe Fest, including Rock for Equality, Sonic Masquerade, Fort Myers Zine Fest, and Punk Brunch. Plus, LYR operates a zine library at Nini's House in East Fort Myers that provides free access to Spanish and English bilingual art and writing zines. LYR continues to publish a zine biannually, which has grown into a therapeutic arts workbook. It's through these cultural products, experiences, and events that Love Your Rebellion works to leave a lasting impact. Support for Love Your Rebellion's music, art, and writing programs serves Florida's marginalized artists, writers, and musicians. They are a cause very near and dear to our hearts as our very own and Changeling is on our board of directors, and we love everything he does. Please, check out Love Your Rebellion and spread the word. And now, on to the show. So, to begin with, let's discuss a little bit what Hunter means. The fifth edition is still very, very new. You can get it from Renegade Press. And it departs dramatically from the Hunter the Reckoning that you may have known and loved or not, it was a divisive title back in the 90s. Now, most vampires and other things that go bump in the night know to be afraid of organizations like the Second, Second Inquisition, the Special Affairs Division, or even the Arcanum. These are very well-organized, well-funded groups of mortals who hunt monsters for their own ends. The Second Inquisition, for example, believes that they are doing God's work by exterminating vampires. Given the relationship between God and Cain, they may not even be wrong on that point. The Special Affairs Division, in Counterpoint, is a branch of the U.S. government which seeks to capture and study supernatural creatures. Hunters, of the type you will be playing tonight, are not part of these groups. You are playing people who have had personal and lasting brushes with the supernatural. These brushes have given each of your characters a drive to protect others, to put monsters down, to put a final end to anything threatening humanity. Groups like the Second Inquisition or the Special Affairs Division look at people like you and they see vigilantes who have or are willing to go too far. You look back at these groups in turn and see people unwilling to do what must be done to keep the world safe, but they are corrupt bureaucracies or misguided or worse. Now, how do you accomplish the hunt? Let's go over the game's basic mechanics. So when I, the storyteller, present you with a problem, you tell me how you want to solve that. I will tell you which attribute and skill you draw on. For each dot you have in that attribute and skill, you will roll one ten-sided dice. You can roll dice at home or use the dice roller provided by roll 20. So, you're trying to sneak past a dozing security guard. I'll ask you to roll dexterity plus stealth. If you have two dots in dexterity and three dots in stealth, you will be rolling five dice. Unless I say otherwise, you want to roll six or above on these dice. This means any roll six or higher counts as a success. 
If you roll a 10, that counts as two successes. For some actions, you may need to accrue more than one success. If you are dissatisfied with your roll, you may spend one dot of willpower to re-roll three of your dice. You may not re-roll desperation dice. Well, it's a desperation dice? I'm glad you asked. You'll notice on your sheet a tracker that says desperation. You all start at one. If you roll no successes but end up with a one in your dice pool, your desperation goes up by one. It may also go up by one, either individually as a group, if you experience narrative setbacks in your goals and aims. Achieving your goals conversely causes desperation to go down. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. So, what does all of this mean in play? If you are attempting an action that falls within your creed, you may use desperation dice. This represents your character putting their all into a goal, something that they believe in above everything else. Add a number of dice to the pool equal to your desperation. These dice should be visually distinct or rolled separately from your other pool, because if you get a 1 on a desperation dice, not only do you fail, but you experience either overreach or despair. With overreach, you have revealed your plan, or some aspect of your plans, to your quarry, and they will respond appropriately. With despair, you experience self-doubt, and you cannot utilize desperation dice until you've done something to redeem yourself. Your drive should give guidelines as to how you can achieve this. Lastly, you regain willpower by spending time with your touchstones. These are usually chronicle specific and often people outside the hunt. Your friends, your family, your coworkers, your pets. However, that's a little beyond the scope of what we're doing tonight with this one shot. So we're going to be doing something a little different from rules as written. You are all each other's touchstones. When you risk your own safety or sacrifice to help one of your teammates, you both restore a point of spent willpower. <coughs> Excuse me. Your willpower can never go above what it is right now. All right. Do we have any questions at this point? Okay. Awesome. So, we're going to start with a little ice breaking because these are single shot, one shot characters. Uh, and I want you to get a chance to feel them. So, we're going to do some icebreaker questions. All right, we're going to start with Elaine. I'm going to roll on these tables that Tyler sent me forever and a day ago. Oh. Okay, Elaine, Carl, what does Carl think is the true meaning of life? <laughs> uh, Carl. Carl is a security guard. <clears throat> true meaning of life. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, what gets him out of bed in the morning? is friends. Okay. Having good friends, like legitimate good friends, people he can rely on. And he's content with that. Okay. So what would Carl ever do if one of his friends fell through and demonstrated that they weren't actually that trustworthy or reliable even? he would have a chat with that friend okay you know let's let's go get a beer and uh, talk about it. what ha what happened all right uh harry what is your character's name uh my character's name is william okay he insists you call him william not bill um oh yeah, that's right. his name 
What is William's relationship with his parents and siblings? Um, well, there, he doesn't like being called Bill because that's a bit similar to his father, who he is not on great terms with. But with the rest of his family, he's pretty cool. There were, uh, there were probably some disagreements over his course in life. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And so things have cooled, I think. Okay. Uh, so, Lisa, you're playing Jillian. Bring up the questions. I clicked away from them. All right. If Jillian could go back in time and change one thing about her life, what would it be and why? Um, she would not, she, her brother, um, died under mysterious circumstances because she asked him to go to the store for her. If she could go back in time, she would have went herself. Okay. What was your brother's name? Chad. Excellent. All right. Next up, we have Panda. So, that doesn't count. All right. What is currently motivating your character to spend time with this group of people? Find the vampire, study the vampire. Find the vampire, study the vampire. She became a hunter, well, Dr. Sakani became a hunter when in the emergency room, she started to notice a pattern suggesting that something wasn't right. Maybe it was a lot of patients with low blood counts. Maybe it was a funny sample that didn't seem quite right of some supernaturally tainted blood. Maybe it was just an anecdote or people with injuries. Maybe it was one of the inevitable vampire gets brought in because they're unconscious and people think that they're dead and then they get rescued from the emergency room. Whatever it is, it's a problem and she wants to understand it. Even more than that, um, Sultani is disproportionately motivated to help other people and she's a little bit of an adrenaline junkie like most um, ER doctors. Unlike the rest of her family who are all plastic surgeons and so forth, she specifically picked this field because she wants to help people. Okay. I love that. All right. Uh, Mandy, describe a moment where you felt zealous. Let me try that again. I'll do the whole lean forward thing. Zealous is an interesting word. You normally hear it used around religion. And really, my most zealous moments don't have a whole lot to do with God because I feel like I'm staring in the face of the devil. So those moments where you know the monsters are real and all I can really do is whatever I need to, to kill. Excellent. All right. Last but not least, uh, Luke Aronson. How important is freedom to you? What would you be willing to give up to keep your freedom? Uh, well, freedom, freedom is the whole shebang. Doing something could be bad just because it's not freely done. What would he give up?
Hmm. He could give up music if he had to. Okay. That's rough. If he had to. If he had to. Wouldn't be a first choice. Okay. All right. Thank you all for indulging me in this. Uh, So, as a very quick note, we have various boons and banes that you, our lovely audience, can purchase with real world dollars. So, the boons. For five dollars, you can add, excuse me, two dice to any pool uh, that a player is about to make. For ten dollars, you will lower the success threshold along with adding uh, an extra two dice to the pool. So instead of having to roll six or above, uh, you'll have to roll five or above or four or above. For $20, we will ignore ones on a desperation die. So you can also, if you really like watching us suffer, purchase Banes. For $5, uh, you can subtract two dice from a pool. For $10, you can raise the success threshold and remove two dice from a pool. So instead of having to roll six, you'll have to roll sevens or eights and above. And for $20, all dice act as desperation die. So. Uh, And I see we already have, uh, formerly known as Spank My Betty, uh, all dice in the next roll for each player. So the first roll you make, uh, all dice function as desperation dice. So, uh, you know, don't roll ones. I must spank my Betty. Back at it again. Formerly known as Spank My Betty, Twitch got after him for his nickname. Oh. Boo. Yeah. Boo Twitch. But it's okay. It's okay. We remember. So, before we launch into the story... Does anyone have any last minute questions or clarifications or anything you want to throw out there? Okay. Cool. Excellent. So let's jump right into it. All of you more or less know about the existence of monsters. You have had questionable encounters in the past. How much credence, how much weight, how much belief or faith you put on these encounters, I will leave up to you. However, whatever happened to you, it was strong enough and compelling enough that you have devoted at least part of your time and your life and your resources to the hunt. You are also associated to a greater or lesser degree with Mercy General, a non-profit hospital serving the most unfortunate in your city. Every year, Mercy General hosts a fundraising gala, both to raise more money and to thank their most generous donors. You, as a group, have come to believe that a vampire is infiltrating this gala. You don't know who, You don't know why, you don't know what they hope to accomplish. Just, you're pretty sure there will be a vampire at this party. Your mission is to figure out which of the guests is, in fact, the vampire, and put an end to their crimes against humanity and their god. The gala is happening in the Surgeon's Lounge, on the top floor of a seven-story hospital. This is normally a very nice space where surgeons can go to prepare or recover from long and demanding surgeries. On gala nights, it becomes even nicer. There will be rows of catered food, an open bar, and wait staff moving through the space with glasses of champagne, wine, and trays of hors d'oeuvres. A small dance floor will be laid down where a DJ plays very trendy dance music. So, 
One item of incredible importance. The hospital is still operating during the gala. That is to say, there are mothers giving birth in the maternity wards, patients sleeping off chemotherapy and oncology, and a few unfortunates fighting for their lives in the ICU. The ER is still admitting accident victims and finding beds for patients with heart pains. They're watched over by a small team or army of physicians and nurses. Which is to say, a very dramatic mover like blowing up the whole building to get to one vampire will cost dozens if not hundreds of innocent lives. Aww. That's not to say I won't disallow it, only that your hunters should be prepared to pay the moral and criminal cost of such a path of action. That being said, you do have access to anything reasonably within a hospital. Iodine, oxygen tanks, diamond sharp scalpels, copious amounts of morphine and other controlled substances. These might be more or less difficult to obtain, but they are within your grasp. Do note, however, that many public spaces in this hospital are monitored by camera. However, a few of you know how to get to these spaces. So, are there any questions right now? Excellent. So, we are going to open this game not on the night of the gala, but the day before. You know this is coming. You are reasonably sure that there is a vampire there. And so the question right now is what sort of planning and preparation do you want to do? Now, as a further point of clarification, there will not be any sort of metal detectors or anything of that nature that you will have to pass through to gain access. However, none of you have a lot of money. Even the minor celebrity. You know, like, it's it's been a while since you've got a really nice residual check. So, you will be able to purchase small arms, essentially anything that you could obtain at uh, your favorite local gun store, but anything more than a handgun, a shotgun, a really nice hunting knife, so things like grenades, dragon's breath rounds, those are beyond your capability to get. This is very much a street level, let's get creative with what we've got type of game. So, uh, we are going to set you uh, in your safe house. This is a shared apartment. None of you really sleep here, unless you have to. You all have homes and families elsewhere in the city. But this is just where you come together keep all the stuff you don't want your kids getting into and plan your next affairs. So I give the floor to you. Hey, I'm going to need to knock out soon. I'm on call tonight. So if my pager goes off, I'm going to need to go to the hospital. So does everyone need a tutorial on how these thermometers work? No. My character begins handing around relatively inexpensive remote read thermometers, the infrared kinds that you may be familiar with from COVID because she's too smart for her own good. <laughs> That's clever. You see, I was thinking we would go all in. Like if all of us pooled our money, we could maybe afford like a cheap thermal camera, but this is better. So. <clears throat> but I mean, how reliable are they? So the benefit. Not I'm sorry, continue, Panda. I was going to say, these aren't perfect. You can't use them across a room to get anything other than the ambient air temperature. But, um, and I could give you a regular thermometer as well. You could just get them at the pharmacy. Uh, just contact one like you'd use on children. If you can press this to someone, you can pretty reliably get a read. Um, mathematics of storyteller allowing. From a shorter distance, you can get an approximation that if they're not body temperature, it's not probably alive. That is to say, if it's not what 
team, whatever the hell they're calling themselves now, is claiming about the extra warm vampire down in Memphis. I don't know what that was. I leave it to you to sort it out. And oh crap, my pager just went off. So, uh, the one thing that I will rule as storyteller is, yes, uh, especially in the post-COVID years, you can absolutely get a hold of these infrared thermometers. However, using them will not be subtle. They are not. They are bulky little things. You could probably conceal them on yourself, but you're just pointing them around the room. They won't work, so... Or you're going to have to do some explaining. Yeah. Um, or, hear me out, do you have a spare set of scrubs? Well, I mean, I heard that some of them can pretend to be alive. Like, look like they have a pulse. Oh, so that's that plan out the window. You see, I was thinking we get a spare pair of scrubs, pretend to be a nurse take everyone's temperature going in, that would make sense, but if they can, if they see that coming, then yeah, also, it's basically useless. Do we know that they're going through the front door? Maybe this vampire is pulling a Dracula and turning into a bat going through a sewer grate. I don't know. I wouldn't want to oh. count it out just if we use that alone. So, yeah, we're not going to use this as the only trick in our tool bag. Um, looking at her pager, um, answering someone, what precisely is the information we have from our tip? So you have been collectively doing research on vampires in the city, uh, and you've just heard a lot of hints and illusions and rumors that make you pretty sure that there's going to be a vampire at this gala tonight. Did we learn this from other hunters? Did we learn this from like deranged babblings of a victim? So Did we learn this from a prior kill where we found some information? So have have you seen uh, either the actual episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia or the meme that was derived for it of Charlie Day in front of a huge cork board where there's like pinned up clippings and printouts and yarn and uh, annotations. You essentially have something like this uh, in your safe house. And it all adds up to there's probably a vampire controlling the hospital or at least involved with the day-to-day -day runnings of the hospital. And so just like, a lot of circumstantial evidence. You can excuse this one unit of blood going missing. You can excuse this other strange disappearance. But when it all adds together, and then you add in your experience as hunters, this is the answer you come up with. I'm especially annoyed about the doctors giving back blood drive go entire take going missing right no and like and it should be a big deal in the fact that it isn't like that's you know just another sign yeah, that someone would be fired over that yeah is there a guest list for this event <clears throat> do i there... have that guest list being a security uh, guard? Yeah, go ahead. Let's see. There's not really a luck roll. Uh, give me... Wits plus leadership, please. Wits. And, uh... Okay. And remember that, uh, thanks to formerly known as Spake My Betty, these are all desperation dice. So do let me know if you roll any ones. I do. Oh, no. I have a nine and a one. 
Oh no! <clears throat> All so right. So it begins. So it begins. Okay. So, uh, I will let you decide. So, do you want this to become overreach or despair? So, with overreach, you will have shown your hand uh, to your quarry. Not completely. Just, you have all these red flags, and now they've got one red flag. Or, you can choose to experience despair which is uh, you experience self-doubt and you cannot utilize any further desperation dice until you've done something in your own eyes to redeem yourself. All right, I won't affect the entire group. I'll just take the bulk of it. So I can't use the spare until I forgive myself. Okay. So, what we'll say is uh, this will require a little bit of yes and, so let me know if this doesn't work for you. Uh, you obtain the guest list, and while you are obtaining this list, you make a, like some small talk with the people uh, who are in charge of security. Uh, and so... You are reminded of an old friend who you lost for whatever reason you weren't there for them. You didn't necessarily believe them. You didn't prioritize them. And this memory just sort of sticks in your head and you can't really shake it. All right. Okay. So you. But I do have a guest list. <clears throat> yes, you do. All uh, right. So, go into my jacket. It's all kind of folded up on itself, and I unfold it and I give it to. Uh, since Luke asked for it, I uh, throw it on the table. Yeah, we got uh, we got this. It's not much, but yeah, there's a few people on that list. Something hey. to start. However. Some of the names, so you get you get a name like Cassandra Jones, who you recognize as the CEO of this hospital. Of course, she'd be there. So it's Cassandra Jones and guest. Mm. It says guest. Is it like plus one, plus two, plus three? Most people are and guest. Well, um, I have a question for the storyteller. How yes. posh is this event? Because I'm with the catering staff, so if it's posh enough that people like put in their orders ahead of time, it's like, yes, I want the chicken. Yes, mm -hmm. I want the steak. Uh, that might at least give us a better head count, but I can also keep an eye out for anything weird or odd mm -hmm. substitutions that occur in the kitchen. Okay. Uh, yeah, you absolutely can. Uh, so this is about a 50-person shindig. Uh, it is buffet style. Uh, and then what other questions did you have? Um, well, if it's buffet style, I guess just keep an eye out for anyone making weird substitutions or put someone else on the catering staff up to it, be like, hey, I heard someone's going to try to spike something. Like, keep an eye out on it. Um, something like that. Uh, you don't want this to end up being like some drunk prom night. Uh, yeah. Uh, just a thought. Okay. Uh, so the head caterer is a woman named Bethy. And you can absolutely tell her that you heard this rumor from a disgruntled employee. Uh, you know, she's she's a pretty good manager. Uh, when you call her, uh, she says that she is scrambling to find coverage because two of her people called out 
Uh, and so, you know, if she can't find coverage, then uh, she's going to hit the floor as a worker like the rest of you. Okay. And uh, Mandy looks around the room at the other hunters and is like, I might have a couple of people that don't have much catering experience, but can probably stand in to refill stuff. I'll get back to you. Thank you so much. You're a lifesaver. Yeah, you're the best boss ever. Uh, <laughs> talk to you later. And uh, she hangs up and says, okay. Does anyone not have a good reason to be there so you can join the catering staff for the night? I'm going to be on duty, so. I not only have a good reason to be there, I'm supposed to be part of the squad um, making people feel good for donating, and I'm still on call. So at any point of the night, I'll maybe call to go save someone's life. Be aware of this in our tactical planning. I mean, I'd rather not, but if you need me to do catering, I will. So for spare scrubs, for cover-up, how many suits do we need? I cannot fake you hospital badges. If I do that, that may cause issues. You're going to need to talk to the security guard who has more access to the printing of those. It's not something I have access to, but I can provide you with a large quantity of various scrubs. And if you want, I can dress you up like a patient. Which you'll very much blend in. I mean, it, it is reasonable. There will be a couple of patients there who are like uh, tricky cases where the hospital is like, look at this person that we saved from rabies or whatnot. I think a patient look would, look, would go well on me. I'm, I'm pale enough to, uh, I have that nice sickly pallor that the Victorians would have adored. <laughs> and I'm yeah, covering right. an article for the paper. Um, Julia's gonna ask Luke for the uh, for the guest list. Yeah, sure. See, looky I'm here. Gonna rehearse with our wannabe patient and start uh, basically teaching him how to act like he's chronically ill with something. And pick something really gnarly and difficult to use as basically a dummy patient. Okay. So I need you to explain to the donors how the hospital made a real difference in both your addiction issues and managing your <laughs> autoimmune condition. I'm I'm sure I can do a wonderful job at that. I'll do my best, I guess. So, okay. so wait, am I am I donning like just the the like the one piece cheap plastic robe, walking around with like an IV drip, or? Oh, you are not going to be in a paper hospital gown. You will be in real person no. clothes. Okay, wonderful, perfect. I was thinking that would be a little on the nose for this fundraiser. However, if you need to disappear into the hospital, I will try to stash scrubs and so forth in places around the hospital where you can easily grab them if you're fleeing. Yeah, it will or if not you need be... need to travel around, for example, in service entrances and stuff. Yeah, with uh, your character's support, it will not be difficult at all to obtain either patient gowns or nurse scrubs. Wonderful. The trick I, is getting the nurse to put them back on again afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep the patient down and like fold it up in a pocket because I'm sure it folds very small. Uh, Jillian, what were you going to do? Oh, with it the does. List? It's very. Um, well, I have a few articles. Look at here Botch Blood Drive. NICU nurse goes missing. Doctor torn to pieces. I want to see if any of the names in any of these articles correlate with the name on the guest list. Okay. That's a fun roll. Go ahead and give me a wits plus investigation, please.
What would count as a success? Uh, anything that you roll is six or higher counts as a success. If you roll a ten, that counts for two. Five successes. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so, as you're cross-referencing, uh, you see uh, a news article uh, about a late night car accident that happened, you know, on the outskirts of town. Uh, and fortunately, the driver, uh, Micah, was able to walk away along with his passenger, a guy named Bert. And you see on the guest list is the name Micah, and his plus one is already named Bert. Looks like I have some interviews lined up. Question for the storyteller. How much midazolam and lorazepam can I have? What do those drugs do? Midazolam is a um, fast-acting um, tranquilizer, which is also an amnesiac. They give you for short-term surgical procedures. So you don't remember the trauma of being cut open, even the physiological stuff. It's very good if we need to, say, knock out a witness and have them be more or less okay. Whereas um, lorazepam is a water-soluble benzodiazepine, which means if we need to roofie someone, <laughs> I have access to basically roofies that have not been given a flavoring agent, so you can't roofie people. And, well, getting caught with this would probably cause a huge stink and an issue. It's worth giving, for example, some injectable uh, midazolam to the security guard. So if he needs to be like, come on, we'll get you out of here, poke. It, it like, just, oh, to, wrong, yeah. just want a medical librarian here. I uh, want to point out that most hospitals, all hospitals, because they have to keep track of their stock of both of those medications, so you would not be able to take out a large quantity without being flagged and picked up by security immediately. Well, not without being flagged and picked up by security, unless, say, you had someone who was very, very good at uh, modifying computer programs that would um, report that. All right. So I have three lots of allies, hospital personnel. Okay. I think I can get someone to fake the records. All right. So with I can two wipe dots. the records, no problem. With two dots, I will give you two doses of each. Yay! I have three dots. <sighs> All right, so when and if <clears throat> we find this vampire, what are we doing with him or her or it, they? What, 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 what are we doing? We're just like going to like, Hey, show it, follow us. Come show it to us. the world. Take a wild guess. <laughs> show it the to the world. To I just want us. you to guess. We're no, no, we're not showing it to the world. We're gonna smoke it. In front of everybody? Probably not in front of everybody. I need a blood sample for my research. Wouldn't it be great to have lots of blood samples because people knew vampires were real and they knew not to be hunted by them? I think we... It's not a matter just... of people not... All right. I think you that we first. should plan on, like, seeing if we can get alone and staking the damn thing. Because uh, then you can get all the samples you you want and we can get but it out of there. how do we know that that's even going to work? Buffy does Never it all dealt the time. With this stuff before? Buffy's a movie and a TV series. <laughs> this is real life. Like 50% of the stuff in that show works. How do uh, you know? Are... So you can give like me being staked in the heart. Anyone who has dots of a cult can give me intelligence a cult role. I do not. <laughs> I do not. Uh, and I also I have do. one desperation die, correct? Uh, yes, this counts as rolling desperation dice. And now they are all roll. desperation dice, thanks to our donor. Uh, and it was my what first plus roll cult? as well, right? Uh, uh, what was the question? Intelligence or wits plus a cult? Intelligence, please. Okay. No ones for me. That's an eight, a nine, two, two successes.
two successes as well. Okay. Uh, so the both of you are fairly certain that staking will work. Whether it will paralyze the vampire or kill it, you're not exactly sure on either of that. Uh, but yes, a uh, stake will work. Uh, you also have reason to believe, uh, because you both got two successes, uh, sunlight and fire are also pretty effective. Now, sunlight's going to be tricky because this is going to be happening during the nighttime. But, you know, there's probably a UV lamp down here somewhere. Oh, UV sterilizer in hand. <clears throat> Add also... that to the gear list. And if we've never killed a vampire before, and I don't think the group has much medical background, my character will give people a tutorial on how to find the heart and what is the anatomy of the rib cage. <laughs> because I don't necessarily know that everyone would know. Like the caterer, if I know that they're a former veteran, I figure they know how to find the approximate right spot. But not necessarily everybody else. So, it would be very annoying if we accidentally stabbed them in the lungs. So, I mean, all right, staking is on the table. What about, like, it's a vampire, right? It drinks blood. What about injecting it with some coagulants. Wouldn't that do anything? I mean, that's what I'd like to research. I mean, you could always kidnap the vampire and test it. I gotta say, that, that, say, that is an absurdly risky proposition. I would rather this thing be gone. Of course, if you want to try to kidnap this vampire, then that is up to you. But just know that I won't hesitate to wipe it out. If you can get me a blood sample, what I can do is test it with coagulants later in the lab because we don't know if that'll work or not. The blood right. samples might be enough to help bring light to this in the world. I'm not opposed to destroying the thing. I don't propose we stake it and keep it around. But uh, my first choice would be, you know, stake it put it in the sunlight, live stream that with some news crews. <laughs> Man, you I really want to... Is... Well, yeah, because I don't think we should have to be the ones going out here and risking our literal necks to some vampire. Everybody should be in on this. The strength other... of numbers. Look, there are plenty of other lunatics who do this as well. Not and enough. Not, not only that, order. but if we're risking exposing them... Um, just think how many more angry vampires are going to come after us. Well, I mean, how many vampires do you think there are? 50, 100? There's a lot more than that. My current estimations based on what I was charting was at least 8 million. Just based mm -hmm. that can't on the be right. support of the population what? based on death rate. Ever, can I make a point of order on the problems with trying to reveal something? How many homeless people did you walk past on your way here? A lot. Too many. But did you count them? Well, no. No. All this information is broadly available for anyone to count and anyone to see. You can see it on the nightly streets, but nobody bothers to pay any attention to it. It's not that we need to just break through and let them see the reality. It's that they don't care. The system is broken. The cavalry's not coming. No, there's cavalry out there. They just won't work with us. Just don't. This might be a little cart and horsey, though. Uh, I think we have to find the vampire, or at least have a guess on who it is, before we do anything, because... Uh, this all might be a moot conversation of what this, we do. This guy this. who survived his car crash with his buddy, can I do, like, an internet deep dive into them to see if I can, like, get a digital trace of them? Because if one was kindred, they would not really be leaving much of a digital trail, right? So I want to see if I can find if I what kind of digital trails I can place together. Uh, yeah, give me a uh, intelligence computers, please. Hell yeah. This is where I, this is where I, I thrive. 
Uh, would that be technology? I'm assuming. Uh, yes, technology. My good roll. Uh, one, two, three, four, five successes. Okay. It takes you a while. It's pretty well buried. Uh, there's nothing in the headlines, nothing in like uh, online white pages, anything like that. But once you start delving into property records, you find the name Micah associated with uh, one of those boats that go just far away enough uh, to be free of state laws. And then there's a whole bunch of gambling. So it's like a casino boat. So he's associated with like an owner, a... Uh, owner. It's in his name. Owns a casino boat. That's interesting. However, I don't know if that's necessarily... Proof. But that's interesting to look into. His friend, yeah. did I find anything or no? Uh... You find, uh, yeah, you find some vital records. Um, as far as you can tell, the guy's about 50 years old. Started working for this guy maybe 20 years ago. Any photos? Yeah, you find some photos. Is he consistent with his age? Does he age in various photos over the years? Uh, so you only find photos of Bert. Um, okay, looks, so then our target's the buddy. He looks oh, really yeah. good for his age. Him too, that targets both mm. of them. So Bert and this other guy are certainly people of interest. Although, I mean, Bert looks great for his age, but this other guy, I mean, I got nothing on him. He's a ghost. So, so if Micah is the other one right and you're you're telling me you've got a ghost uh not a connected. literal ghost no no I mean, no. but uh, yeah you can't find anything i uh, i will there's a few uh, vital records but nothing beyond that not the normal I, stuff people leave can i use one of my uh hunter edges in this scenario to try and get a little bit more uh hidden data that might be out there on servers about micah pictures and driver's licenses or what have you. Oh, what would you like to do? Uh, use the uh, global access edge. Okay. Um, and I'm not altering any records. I am only trying to uh, find them. All right. So go ahead and give me an intelligence plus technology role. It is difficulty four, so you're going to need to accumulate four successes. Gotcha. Uh, intelligence technology. Mm hmm Okay. Oh. Right. Uh, I am unlikely to hit that four. I hit two successes. All right. So you could, if you want, roll some desperation dice. Uh, what you can also do is you can spend a willpower and re-roll three dice from your pool. I don't have enough dice. I have four dice. So it would only get me two more dice. Okay. I need to hit both of them. All right. Well, so you did roll a couple successes. So... You can tell that this guy is a ghost. Like, he is not present in the public records where you would expect him to be. Hmm. And voila, your we record... have a person of interest. Did your records include the recent vaccination records? He's a vampire and an anti-vaxxer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right now we just kill him i don't care no. about showing him the world now uh i i will say that to get into uh medical records like that uh you would either need more successes or to do this on site at the hospital 
something to consider looking into at the hospital because if he does have medical records and he turns out to be a vampire, that also might give us leads on who's helping um, them. I mean, accessing records is not the problem. Yeah, I mean, really the only annoying part is if there's still the earlier paper records that someone hasn't gotten around to digitizing. That and reading right. a photocopy of a photocopy of a medical report. So, uh, is there any more preparation or research that you want to do before it's go time? Well, I have an edge called Drone Jockey and my autonomous armaments. Uh huh. Do I have a drone with a gun on it? Like, what does that mean? All right, so uh, you roll wits plus technology to control the drone, and intelligence plus craft to repair or rebuild it. So, when you acquire it, the drone is equipped to perform two skills. A rugged walker might possess athletics and brawl, while a covert flyer has stealth and awareness. So the type of drone used by the hunter is determined at acquisition. So that means right now. Uh, so... Covert flyer. I have an okay. idea. Can I wire the so? And this, uh, which are the two perks that you have? Uh, autonomous and armaments. Okay, autonomous. You can program simple behaviors into the drone, such as patrol and attack patterns. Complicated decision trees need a successful resolve plus technology test. Uh, difficulty depends on how complex you are programming it to be. Uh, and then, uh, what was the other one? Armaments. You can arm with the equivalent of a submachine gun or a taser using a flat five dice pool to use it. Wonderful. Well, I guess a taser would probably be best just because muscles will respond to electrical stimulation no matter what. Um, but also, here's an idea. One of the thermometers. We take one of those, we rig it up to the drone, and since we give it autonomous, we, I, I, I program it to go person to person, like, above, and try to scan while remaining. I don't know how what the range of those types of thermometers are, but maybe I could tinker with it and give it a boost. And we could slowly but surely collect data on the entire room. Well, wouldn't it be weird <laughs> to have a drone just fly around in the room? That's, Can a that's drone, the catch. Your drone also supports sort of banner showing the total donations made. Oh, no problem. That's brilliant. Because I feel like a drone from Congratulations. Um, what was the total donation amount this gala raised just offhand? It might be something I'd have access information to. Like, congratulations, $120,000. We did it. Fuck, let's put a QR code on the banner so that people can scan it with their phone <laughs> if they want. That <laughs> that'll encourage people to get closer to it so we can more accurately scan their temperatures. Okay. Uh, so. Yes. <laughs> This is a good idea. So you've given your drone stealth and awareness. It has a flat five die pool for anything that you are trying to accomplish regarding these stealth and awareness. Uh, so when we get to the hospital, uh, I will make one roll per hour. And uh, the number of successes that I roll are the number of people that you will be able to sufficiently test. Hell yeah. And I'm gonna set this up to like a wireless, like a, to a, I'm gonna make it fill in like a spreadsheet on a Google Drive folder that I'm gonna share with everybody. Okay. That way, worst case scenario, the data is still accessible even without me. All right. Any so, other planning? So uh, we suspect Micah and Bert. Can we get addresses on either of them? If we think they're a blank get, body... I guess Bert is a ghoul. Yeah. Micah would be the uh, proper blank body. But if we suspect them and we can find where they are, why wait for them to be around all those people? 
Uh, the addresses you get are for the casino boat and the marina where it is at anchor. I mean, we could just wait and then sink the casino. Well, no, then that would kill so many people. Wait a minute, no. <laughs> also, let's confirm this is not somebody who's just, you know, bad on records. Look, a go we went through their details. A ghost is a ghost. This yeah, a ghost has... is a ghost, but we're not... Luke, I I'm not comfortable saying this is our vampire. That is a far reach right now. Sure, I'm comfortable, though, saying that this is a person of interest. Definitely. Yes. I wasn't um, suggesting we take them out in their bathroom or anything, but... I heard something about blowing up houseboats and casino boats. I'm sorry, I misheard. Um, no, you didn't miss here. I, I proposed that, <laughs> and then I realized it was a stupid idea the moment the words left my mouth. You'll notice that's a thing I do both in-game and in real life. All right, so you have your drone. You have your couple doses of uh, anesthetics. Anything else? Um, I make sure that everyone is appropriately equipped with stakes, multiple stakes, just in case, that are small, concealable, and very sharp. Um, does anybody have anything like a firearm or something? Because because we might yeah, need that. I do. I do. Oh, I, do. I 100% do. You won't I'm not item. carrying a firearm, and I don't know how to use one. But yeah, I, sorry, you, I went to McGill for my medical degree. If you have dots in firearms, I presume you're coming with a gun. If you have dots in melee, I presume you're coming with uh, a knife or a machete or some other weapon. Uh, a long to that samurai sword? No. <laughs> That would be a little bit conspicuous. You didn't even dots. live through the nineties. Yeah, I'm. I'm driving through a. Uh, I, I, I'm. I have two dots in drive, so I guess I'm bringing a car. Okay. For um, melee, is something like a taser, like the kind you have to touch onto someone, as opposed to the kind that you fire off? Is that a melee weapon, or is that firearm? Uh, I would say that would be melee. Okay, because I mean, I have one dot of melee and one dot of brawl. Apparently, how I get my kicks is I'm involved with a contact martial arts. Okay. Least, um, when... But, um, and I am the one of the wealthier members of the group at least that i've got two dots of resources so i've told that we're basically all broke I is have there three. anything else we might need like for example oh look at fancy pants good so you're apparently here. wealthier than me because my three two dots. are killing me is there a band playing there is a i'm DJ. very worried there's a dj i was okay. described in my bio as one of the highest paid doctors in the city Man, so if we have any collateral damage of the hospital CEO, we're just doing God's work. So, uh, I guess another question, uh, this would sort of be meta, Do, what knowledge of any vampire triggers might we have? Uh, the sight of blood or other things that would help us discern a vampiric reaction from a non-vampiric reaction? Garlic? Yeah, so uh, with that occult roll that I made you roll earlier, uh, you know stakes work, you know some light works, you know fireworks. Other than that, uh, you're sort of guessing. So would garlic work? I'm bringing some garlic. But uh, one thing... One thing I will let you know is, as far as you understand, uh, vampires are the animate dead. Humor me. Is this an environment where, um, I'm a Canadian and I don't know what access that an American game would have to various things. When you said small arms, I was like, yeah, six months from now you might get one. Um, this how is the United States, you want one? Yeah. Flash yes. Time? Uh, I'm sorry, what's the question? How easy would it be to acquire flashbang? Um, 
Not that difficult. Uh, so I can give you two That's flashbangs. That's something we should consider. Yeah, yeah, there two is two flashbangs. Have... These are like use it at a moment. Say, these would definitely be a use in emergency situations only and possibly a flare gun. Flare gun is also very easy Which to I have by. no firearm, so that would Flare gun. Yeah, flare gun is shoot flamey thingy. You that actually sounds like a good They're all unsafe. A flare gun sounds like a good backup for a normal firearm. Now, yeah, interestingly so, enough, some okay. guy in like the Bronx or something, like in real life the other day, rigged up his car with a flashbang. So when people robbed it, they got flashbanged. All right. It worked. Uh, so with that, because some of us are on a hard time limit, uh, yes. we're going to take a very quick break, uh, just about five, ten minutes. So get some water, stretch your legs, and when we come back, it will be time to go to the party at the hospital. All right. Hi, I'm going to disappear and read. The founder and the chair of the board of directors of Love Your Rebellion, a 501c3 that empowers marginalized groups through the arts, including women, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQIA communities, people from low income communities, and people with disabilities by creating opportunities in the arts that employ, discover, and assist. Before I tell you more about Love Your Rebellion, let me tell you a little bit about my background and expertise. Prior to founding Love Your Rebellion, I spent nine years teaching English, creative writing, and sociology in higher education. I hold a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Creative Writing from the University of Central Florida and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative and Critical Writing from Goddard College with a specialization in feminist theory and poetry. I'm also a professional musician with experience in live performance and audio production. My studies and my time in the classroom showed me how different life can be based on things like race, gender, sexual orientation, orientation, ethnicity, ability, and class. But I learned those life experiences pretty early on. The distinct overlap of being the child of a gay Italian-American parent really exemplified to me how inaccessible the world can be to someone who's part of one or more marginalized groups. The problems LYR seeks to solve are lack of opportunities in the arts and lack of accessible arts experiences for people from marginalized groups. The organization takes on this problem by creating programming through an approach we've coined called Diversity First. So instead of creating programming and then figuring out how to make it diverse, LYR begins with diversity in mind, then we create programming from that perspective. Diversity First also maintains that at least 80% of artists, writers, and performing artists contracted, provided exposure or assistance via Love Your Rebellion, self-identify as women, immigrants, people of color, people from queer and trans communities, people from low-income communities, and or people with disabilities. Love Your Rebellion Zine Library is an ongoing example of diversity first programming. Zines chosen for the library showcase varying identities, experiences, languages, and cultures. Library entrance is free. In fact, all LYR programming is free or low cost in order to make arts experiences more accessible. Love Your Rebellion Zine Library falls in the 33905 zip code of Lee County. 35% of the residents are Hispanic and 65% of the residents are non-Hispanic or Latino. 37% of the residents are unemployed. There are so many more programs that LYR has developed using Diversity First. I encourage you to visit our website, loveyourrebellion.org or our social media pages at Love Your Rebellion to get a more in-depth look at the impact and the range of our multidisciplinary arts programming, developing programming for from a diversity first approach lowers the barrier to access for opportunities in the arts and experiences in the arts, allowing Love Your Rebellion to empower artists, writers, and performing artists from marginalized groups. Once again, I'm Angela Page, the chair of the board of directors for Love Your Rebellion, and I just really want to thank you for your time and consideration. Hi, I'm Angela Page, the founder and the chair of the board of directors of Love Your Rebellion, a 501c3 that empowers marginalized groups through the arts, including women, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQIA communities, people from low-income communities, and people with disabilities by creating opportunities in the arts that employ, discover, and assist. Before I tell you more about Love Your Rebellion, let me tell you a little bit about my background and expertise. 
Prior to founding Love Your Rebellion, I spent nine years teaching English, creative writing, and sociology in higher education. I hold a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Creative Writing from the University of Central Florida and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative and Critical Writing from Goddard College with a specialization in feminist theory and poetry. I'm also a professional musician with experience in live performance and audio production. My studies and my time in the classroom showed me how different life can be based on things like race, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, ability, and class. But I learned those life experiences pretty early on. The distinct overlap of being the child of a gay Italian American parent really exemplified to me how inaccessible the world can be to someone who's part of one or more marginalized groups. The problems LYR seeks to solve are lack of opportunities in the arts and lack of accessible arts experiences for people from marginalized groups. The organization takes on this problem by creating programming through an approach we've coined called diversity first. So instead of creating programming and then figuring out how to make it diverse, LYR begins with diversity in mind, then we create programming from that perspective. Diversity First also maintains that at least 80% of artists, writers, and performing artists contracted, provided exposure or assistance via Love Your Rebellion self-identify as women, immigrants, people of color, people from queer and trans communities, people from low-income communities, and or people with disabilities. Love Your Rebellion's Zine Library is an ongoing example of Diversity First programming. Zines chosen for the library showcase varying identities, experiences, languages, and cultures. Library entrance is free. In fact, all LYR programming is free or low cost in order to make arts experiences more accessible. Love Your Rebellion Zine Library falls in the 33905 zip code of Lee County. 35% of the residents are Hispanic and 65% of the residents are non-Hispanic or Latino. 37% of the residents are unemployed. There are so many more programs that LYR has developed using Diversity First. I encourage you to visit our website, loveyourrebellion.org or our social media pages at Love Your Rebellion to get a more in-depth look at the impact and the range of our multidisciplinary arts programming, developing programming from a diversity first approach lowers the barrier to access for opportunities in the arts and experiences in the arts, allowing Love Your Rebellion to empower artists, writers, and performing artists from marginalized groups. Once again, I'm Angela Page, the chair of the board of directors for Love Your Rebellion, and I just really wanna thank you for your time and consideration. Hi, I'm Angela Page, the founder and the chair of the board of directors of Love Your Rebellion, a 501c3 that empowers marginalized groups through the arts, including women, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQIA communities, people from low-income communities, and people with disabilities by creating opportunities in the arts that employ, discover, and assist. Before I tell you more about Love Your Rebellion, let me tell you a little bit about my background and expertise. Prior to founding Love Your Rebellion, I spent nine years teaching English, creative writing, and sociology in higher education. I hold a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Creative Writing from the University of Central Florida and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative and Critical Writing from Goddard College with a specialization in feminist theory and poetry. I'm also a professional musician with experience in live performance and audio production. My studies and my time in the classroom showed me how different life can be based on things like race, gender, sexual orientation, orientation, ethnicity, ability, and class. But I learned those life experiences pretty early on. The distinct overlap of being the child of a gay Italian American parent really exemplified to me how inaccessible the world can be to someone who's part of one or more marginalized groups. The problems LYR seeks to solve are lack of opportunities in the arts and lack of accessible arts experiences for people from marginalized groups. The organization takes on this problem by creating programming through an approach we've coined called diversity first. So instead of creating programming and then figuring out how to make it diverse, LYR begins with diversity in mind, then we create programming from that perspective. Diversity First also maintains that at least 80% of artists, writers, and performing artists contracted, provided exposure or assistance via Love Your Rebellion self-identify as women, immigrants, people of color, people from queer and trans communities, people from low-income communities, and or people with disabilities. Love Your Rebellion's Zine Library is an ongoing example of Diversity First programming. Zines chosen for the library showcase varying identities, experiences, languages, and cultures. Library entrance is free. In fact, 
all LYR programming is free or low cost in order to make arts experiences more accessible. Love Your Rebellion Zine Library falls in the 33905 zip code of Lee County. 35% of the residents are Hispanic and 65% of the residents are non-Hispanic or Latino. 37% of the residents are unemployed. There are so many more programs that LYR has developed using Diversity First. I encourage you to visit our website, loveyourrebellion.org, or our social media pages at Love Your Rebellion to get a more in-depth look at the impact and the range of our multidisciplinary arts programming, developing programming for from a diversity first approach lowers the barrier to access for opportunities in the arts and experiences in the arts, allowing Love Your Rebellion to empower artists, writers, and performing artists from marginalized groups. Once again, I'm Angela Page, the chair of the board of directors for Love Your Rebellion, and I just really wanna thank you for your time and consideration. Hi, I'm Angela Page, the founder and the chair of the board of directors of Love Your Rebellion, a 501c3 that empowers marginalized groups through the arts, including women, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQIA communities, people from low-income communities, and people with disabilities by creating opportunities in the arts that employ, discover, and assist. Before I tell you more about Love Your Rebellion, let me tell you a little bit about my background and expertise. Prior to founding Love Your Rebellion, I spent nine years teaching English, creative writing, and sociology in higher education. I hold a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Creative Writing from the University of Central Florida and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative and Critical Writing from Goddard College with a specialization in feminist theory and poetry. I'm also a professional musician with experience in live performance and audio production. My studies and my time in the classroom showed me how different life can be based on things like race, gender, sexual orientation, orientation, ethnicity, ability, and class. But I learned those life experiences pretty early on. The distinct overlap of being the child of a gay Italian-American parent really exemplified to me how inaccessible the world can be to someone who's part of one or more marginalized groups. The problems LYR seeks to solve are lack of opportunities in the arts and lack of accessible arts experiences for people from marginalized groups. The organization takes on this problem by creating programming through an approach we've coined called Diversity First. So instead of creating programming and then figuring out how to make it diverse, LYR begins with diversity in mind, then we create programming from that perspective. Diversity First also maintains that at least 80% of artists, writers, and performing artists contracted, provided exposure or assistance via Love Your Rebellion, self-identify as women, immigrants, people of color, people from queer and trans communities, people from low-income communities, and or people with disabilities. Love Your Rebellion Zine Library is an ongoing example of diversity first programming. Zines chosen for the library showcase varying identities, experiences, languages, and cultures. Library entrance is free. In fact, all LYR programming is free or low cost in order to make arts experiences more accessible. Love Your Rebellion Zine Library falls in the 33905 zip code of Lee County. 35% of the residents are Hispanic and 65% of the residents are non-Hispanic or Latino. 37% of the residents are unemployed. There are so many more programs that LYR has developed using Diversity First. I encourage you to visit our website, loveyourrebellion.org or our social media pages at Love Your Rebellion to get a more in-depth look at the impact and the range of our multidisciplinary arts programming, developing programming from a diversity first approach lowers the barrier to access for opportunities in the arts and experiences in the arts, allowing Love Your Rebellion to empower artists, writers, and performing artists from marginalized groups. Once again, I'm Angela Page, the chair of the board of directors for Love Your Rebellion, and I just really wanna thank you for your time and consideration. Hi, I'm Angela Page, the founder and the chair of the board of directors of Love Your Rebellion, a 501c3 that empowers marginalized groups through the arts, including women, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQIA communities, people from low-income communities, and people with disabilities by creating opportunities in the arts that employ, discover, and assist. Before I tell you more about Love Your Rebellion, let me tell you a little bit about my background and expertise. Prior to founding Love Your Rebellion, I spent nine years teaching English, creative writing, and sociology in higher education. I hold a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Creative Writing from the University of Central Florida and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative and Critical Writing from Goddard College with a specialization in feminist theory and poetry. I'm also a professional musician with experience in live performance and audio production. 
My studies and my time in the classroom showed me how different life can be based on things like race, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, ability, and class. But I learned those life experiences pretty early on. The distinct overlap of being the child of a gay Italian American parent really exemplified to me how inaccessible the world can be to someone who's part of one or more marginalized groups. The problems LYR seeks to solve are lack of opportunities in the arts and lack of accessible arts experiences for people from marginalized groups. The organization takes on this problem by creating programming through an approach we've coined called diversity first. So instead of creating programming and then figuring out how to make it diverse, LYR begins with diversity in mind, then we create programming from that perspective. Diversity First also maintains that at least 80% of artists, writers, and performing artists contracted, provided exposure or assistance via Love Your Rebellion, self-identify as women, immigrants, people of color, people from queer and trans communities, people from low-income communities, and or people with disabilities. Love Your Rebellion's Zine Library is an ongoing example of Diversity First programming. Zines chosen for the library showcase varying identities, experiences, languages, and cultures. Library entrance is free. In fact, all LYR programming is free or low cost in order to make arts experiences more accessible. Love Your Rebellion Zine Library falls in the 33905 zip code of Lee County. 35% of the residents are Hispanic and 65% of the residents are non-Hispanic or Latino. 37% of the residents are unemployed. There are so many more programs that LYR has developed using Diversity First. I encourage you to visit our website, loveyourrebellion.org, or our social media pages at Love Your Rebellion to get a more in-depth look at the impact and the range of our multidisciplinary arts programming, developing programming from a diversity first approach lowers the barrier to access for opportunities in the arts and experiences in the arts, allowing Love Your Rebellion to empower artists, writers, and performing artists from marginalized groups. Once again, I'm Angela Page, the chair of the board of directors for Love Your Rebellion, and I just really want to thank you for your time and consideration. Hi, I'm Angela Page, the founder and the chair of the board of directors of Love Your Rebellion, a 501c3 that empowers marginalized groups through the arts, including women, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQIA communities, people from low-income communities, and people with disabilities by creating opportunities in the arts that employ, discover, and assist. Before I tell you more about Love Your Rebellion, let me tell you a little bit about my background and expertise. Prior to founding Love Your Rebellion, I spent nine years teaching English, creative writing, and sociology in higher education. I hold a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Creative Writing from the University of Central Florida and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative and Critical Writing from Goddard College with a specialization in feminist theory and poetry. I'm also a professional musician with experience in live performance and audio production. My studies and my time in the classroom showed me how different life can be based on things like race, gender, sexual orientation, orientation, ethnicity, ability, and class. But I learned those life experiences pretty early on. The distinct overlap of being the child of a gay Italian American parent really exemplified to me how inaccessible the world can be to someone who's part of one or more marginalized groups. The problems LYR seeks to solve are lack of opportunities in the arts and lack of accessible arts experiences for people from marginalized groups. The organization takes on this problem by creating programming through an approach we've coined called diversity first. So instead of creating programming and then figuring out how to make it diverse, LYR begins with diversity in mind, then we create programming from that perspective. Diversity First also maintains that at least 80% of artists, writers, and performing artists contracted, provided exposure or assistance via Love Your Rebellion, self-identify as women, immigrants, people of color, people from queer and trans communities, people from low-income communities, and or people with disabilities. Love Your Rebellion's Zine Library is an ongoing example of Diversity First programming. Zines chosen for the library showcase varying identities, And we are back. So you've spent some time shopping and planning. You have, among other things, uh, a few pieces of thermite. You each have a stake. Those of you with firearms have a handgun or a uh, flare pistol, if you prefer. Those of you with melee have knives or machetes or a similar weapon. Uh, you also... Uh, we have uh, had to lose a player 
Uh, it is very late where Harry is, and he has to get up early for work, so his character is still around. He has a drone with stealth and awareness that you have rigged up to take uh, infrared temperature, uh, which I will be making those rolls for you. Uh, so, is there anything we want to do before we go to the gala at the hospital? I will politely ask Catering if they're willing to hide a fire axe for me if things get real. Yeah. Thank you so much. Can you, can you also, call me Mandy? <clears throat> the pictures you, Mandy. of the individuals that uh, Harry's character has pinned down mm -hmm. will be passed to the other security officers because I do have them as retainers. Okay. And it's communicate to me on site. Okay. If they see this, these individuals, it's report automatically, location, everything. Okay. Um, uh, you will get back a response pretty quickly after the, the event begins. They are both there, and they appear to have commandeered one of the tables in the room, uh, and they are running a pickup poker game. Alright. Sounds like uh, the kind of game Luke might want to get into. Yeah, so I relay all of that to everybody if we have a group chat on text. Carl, sure. do you know what vehicle they arrived in? I can check that out. So I contact security uh, and I ask okay. them to uh, verify the vehicles. Go ahead and give me Composure plus Subterfuge. Subterfuge. Let's throw some rosy dices. And that is one success. Okay. Uh, it's one of three uh, remarkably similar SUVs. They're not sure which one he arrived in, but it's one of those three. Can't they? I'm asking uh, my security peeps to verify cameras. Okay. See which car, well, the three that we've like, mm -hmm. suspect who gets out of which. Uh, so you're sort of like getting this after the fact. Uh, oh, yeah, you know, just based on who was paying attention when, it's one of these three cars. Okay. Does anyone notice there's some very patchy security camera coverage in our parking lots? Almost like it was a hospital controlled by vampires. <laughs> Could just be budget cuts. Old technology. Not everything is malice. A lot is, but not everything. That's what they want you to think. <laughs> All right. So, you arrive at the hospital, uh, at the gala. Uh, you are all, you know, waved through, shown through. Some of you have cover stories. Others are meant to be here. So, you see there is a woman named Dolores de Corazon. She is a nun in full habit. Uh, there is Cassandra Jones, the hospital CEO. There's Mirabel Alvarez, uh, a very fashionable woman, uh, another big donor. Uh, Dolores, uh, you know, you coordinate with the uh, Catholic hospitals as well. Uh, you've also got Lily, who is the hospital director of outreach. And so she is you know, in charge, essentially, of keeping the donors happy. So she's a very bubbly, charismatic person. She is here as well. Uh, you do also see um, this uh, balding gentleman with um, uh, another friend by his side. 
these are the pictures that you have, Micah and Bert, uh, as reported, doing a poker game in the corner. Uh, and there are a couple more people, uh, including one guy who looks like he almost, like, rolled out of bed, threw on a reasonably clean pair of jeans and a blazer. Um... Uh, you also will recognize Stephen, who is the chief of surgery here. He's very brilliant and arrogant. Uh, you've also got Ernie, the hospital ombudsman. Those of you who work at the hospital knows that his preference is to, uh, you know, rather than solve problems, just push them under the rug. Uh, And then you have another woman. Um, so you've got the woman Dolores in full nun garb. You've got another younger woman sort of like in her orbit, not in full nun garb, but like she's got like her hair covered, a uh, long skirt, very sensible shoes. Um, and Mandy, go ahead and give me a resolve composure, please. Uh, can I spend a willpower to re-roll, or would I have yes. spent the willpower? Okay, so do I re-roll failed dice? Is that how that works? Uh, you can pick whichever three you want to re-roll. Cool, cool. That happens to be my failed dice. It's not the biggest <laughs> tool in the world. That, totally worth it, because now okay. I have four successes. Awesome. So, uh, you... Uh, are getting set up, uh, sort of establishing your cover as one of the caterers, and you notice that there is a guy named Fernando who, uh, you haven't met him. He's introduced as a temp. Um, he clearly, like, this is clearly his first job waiting tables. And it's weird, because he looks like mid to late 30s. And he swears he's done work like this before, but... Um, just all the little things about him, like he's... You'd almost call him a plant. What do his shoes look like? You can learn a lot of things about people <laughs> from their shoes. Okay. He wears really nice black dress shoes. And, like, absolutely not the sort of shoes you would want to wear when you're going to be on your feet all night. So that could either be because he has zero experience or he's a plant. So, uh, for the first hour, I have rolled for the drone. I rolled three successes. So you will be able to get uh, temperature checks on three people. So it's, it's up to you which three you want to test first. Well, I mean, if the suspected individual is currently playing poker at a table, let's scan them. Okay. So that's two. And one, then one more I, for free? One more for free. So I'm not aware of Fernando. The character is not aware. Um, let's go with the nun. Okay, so Bert, warm, Micah, cold, none, hmm. cold. Oh, okay, 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 
right. Uh, and I relay the information. Boat. Micah, cold. <laughs> Dolores, cold. Uh, oh, we need the other person was Bert. Warm. Warm. So, wow, the nun did not expect that. <clears throat> Next person that thing should check is the half nun. That's going to take Just another to make hour. Sure. That yeah. might also be like Bert. Like, that might be the warm to the cold. None in waiting. Very good. All right. Huh. That makes it worse. So, question mark, question mark, question mark in text. I have the ability to go over there and start a conversation, but I don't have the best rapport ability. I'm strong in leadership and um, I have a bit of persuasion, but that's about it. Uh, also, uh, some bad news. Uh, Greg Adulu has just spent $69 to make you suffer. Uh, specific <laughs> no. quote, hurt them hunters good. Well, uh, Luke is still pretty charismatic, he thinks. So if we want someone to go talk to Micah and Bert, I think that would be something he is suited to do. What's our game plan on the conversation? Ask him if the poker proceeds are going to donating to the hospital. Good, good question. I'll ask him if he had any trouble parking and see if you could figure out which is his vehicle so we can disable it and thus allowing us to better nail him when he's not in the middle of a crowded room. You can use an anecdote about how you had trouble parking when you got in. Yeah, I, I can I can pull that off. Are any of our characters aware of ghouls? You can give me an intelligence occult roll if you would like. Any characters with a cult can also roll. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I got two successes. Okay. So I got a one on the despair die I used. Oh, no. And and two successes so okay. i don't know if that so a one on the despair die is always going to be a bad thing no matter how many other successes you roll uh so uh what you will remember is from reading bram stoker's dracula he had that mortal servant renfield and, you know, you've heard rumors that vampires, because they're only active at night, they've got essentially dayminders. Uh, and so for poor Luke, uh, I will also let you choose. Do you want to despair or do you want to overreach? Uh, I think I'm going to overreach. And if we can have that be Luke goes over to talk to them and says something stupid that no one else gets, but the vampire might get. Okay. So you go, you sit down, you get dealt in. And so the rest of you are watching him, you know, play a couple rounds of poker and he is chatting, having a conversation. But then you look up. And it's been almost another hour. And you can't really remember the past hour. You, you're you missing some time here now. Hmm. And, and you look down at your chips and you're doing okay. Uh, you know, you're not winning, you're not losing, you're doing okay. 
So, for this hour, what would the other four of you like to be doing? Well, for the other hour, I'm looking at the data that's been given by the drone mm -hmm. that's been going around. Mm -hmm. And if I get more information on more cold bodies, I relay information in group chat. Okay. Uh, which you will receive after the end of this scene. All right. <clears throat> I use my three dots of awareness to map out who is talking to who. We know that Micah and the nun are the opposite of hot. So who is relating to them and how do they relate to them? All right, go ahead and give me a uh, resolve composure, please. Okay. Uh, okay, resolve and then composure. So up, 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 pardon, I'm still learning some things. So that is the number of dots is dice, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go seven dice. And I got, and it's a success, a six and higher. Yes. And tens one, count two. for two. I got a 10. One, two, three, four, five. So out of six dice, I got five successes, count for double 10 and no ones. All right. That's amazing. So uh, you can tell uh, Dolores is a little put off and that, uh, so you see mostly the people whom you don't recognize, so people who are not associated with the hospital. Uh, when they speak to her, it seems to be with a certain degree of deference. Um, however, uh, Cassie, the CEO, the director of outreach, they are still friendly and accommodating. Um, but, you know, like entirely a different attitude, more like colleague to colleague. Um, And so, uh, you can also see that Lily, Director of Outreach, uh, she will try uh, and uh, move amongst the donors. And she seems to be really the only person who does. Otherwise, it's almost like there are these two groups going on, uh, where it's the people you know, the people you work with, and the donors. And you can tell that... Lily is trying to get them to mix and to blend. Like, hey guys, it's a party. Let's hang out. Let's have fun. Uh, the only other point of contact is at the poker table. So, you know, people walk by, sit down, play a few rounds, get back up, come back. Uh, and so that is... Uh, because you got five successes you also feel like you're being watched a little bit. You can't tell by whom. It's just a feeling. I relay that to the rest of the group. Okay. Mandy and Jillian. Uh, Jillian, you can go first. I missed the last thing that was said. Uh, so Panda's character uh, is spending her time sort of observing the dynamics of the room uh, and can pick up that uh, they're the people who work at the hospital mm -hmm. uh, and they are sort of in their own social group. And then there are the hospital donors who are in their own social group. And the only two points where people are mixing are uh, Lily, the director of outreach, so it's her job to make the donors happy. Uh, and she's the one sort of being a little social butterfly. And then we also have Micah's poker table in the corner where people are also mixing and socializing. Okay, I want to try to make my way towards the poker table. Okay. And I want to make it a point to have two drinks with me. That's not red. Okay. 
Uh, and you will notice Luke is there playing as well. Uh, yeah, and so um, you sit down, you've got two drinks with you. Um, something not red, maybe gin and tonic, old fashioned. I offer it to Micah. Oh, oh, you're too kind. I, I just, I don't like any drink. I didn't pour myself. Bert knows how I get. How about you? Slides it over to Luke. I could go for another drink. Have you tried the, uh, the buffet, Micah? They've got the best, uh, snacks. Oh, yeah. You know, I ate right before I came here. Uh, tell me how it is, though. Delicious. Worth a taste, even if you're full. And so, uh, Jillian, are you in specific looking for anything? I'm just observing Micah, and I'm just trying to find an opportunity to lure him away from the table. All right, give me resolve composure, please. Uh, and we've got seventy dollars worth of banes, so everybody's rolling uh, all desperation dice all the time. Three successes. Nope. Okay, any ones? No. All right. So the thing you notice about Micah, uh, he is parked here. He's going to stay here for the rest of the night. Uh, but he's very friendly. He's really good at deflecting. But you notice, like, when he's dealing the cards, he's incredibly still. And after, like, five minutes, you're pretty sure this guy only breathes when he has to talk. Micah, do you care for a dance? Oh, I couldn't dance right now. I'm winning. And I just look over at Luke like. So what I'll say is here is when Luke says his uh, awkward <laughs> whatever. Uh, and so, Jillian, what you see is Micah make direct eye contact with Luke and just say, huh, be a shame if you forgot that. And that is when you sort of realize, Luke, oh, I just lost an hour of time. Huh, like uh, driving on the highway. Sometimes you just zone out, but I should yeah. be paying a lot more attention. Mm-hmm. I might need to step away from the table for a minute. Okay. And Mandy, what are you up to? Mandy is uh, keeping an eye on uh, Fernando, for one. Mm -hmm. But she's also uh, trying to just sort of monitor I'm trying to figure out how to say it. Um, Mandy's worked these sorts of events before. There's generally patterns people follow concerning like when mm -hmm. like there's an ebb and flow to this sort of thing. Is there anyone not following that sort of pattern that she would be aware of. Absolutely, Fernando. And I will carry forward um, one of your successes. You notice when he thinks nobody else is watching, uh, and you wouldn't even think to notice except you are who you are. Um, he's got an earpiece. 
and it's not like one of the ones that like the United States Secret Service wears with like the very obvious like phone coils like it's a really nice almost sub vocal earpiece and you can like just make out him like uh, two suspected blank bodies three and six o'clock Mm. Uh, Mandy's going to shoot a text to her, uh, I don't know what hunters call them, not a cabal. Cell. Cell? Cell? Thank you. Um, and say, uh, one of the other caterers seems to be uh we we know what si is or a government hunter i'll just she'll just say government hunter you do a government hunter uh or government or a hunter on the payroll however she puts it and says do i just watch him or do i let him know we're here probably better let him know we're here because otherwise we're going to be tripping over each other's feet as the yeah. other people suspiciously try to cover up our behavior. Mandy, do you think you could get him to come into the kitchen long enough to have a quiet talk with him? That's a good I, can, idea. I can be a pretty convincing person. Uh, and Luke will respond in the chat. They cover this shit up. Don't fully trust them. Thumbs up. Other than that, of the party that's kind of separated out of the guests, like you said, there was group A, group B. Mm -hmm. In group A, which seems to be the ones more around Micah and Dolores, how many of those people are doing things like going to the washroom and so forth? As you watch, none of them. It's only been an hour, so who knows? Is there any of that group that's female um, that looks like it would be less suspicious for me to walk by to talk to them? Because I'm going to try engaging to see if I'm getting any sort of human behavior to get anything out of it. And via walking up to one of them and quietly asking her, do you have a tampon? I'm so sorry to ask and looking flustered. Uh, okay, so there is uh, Mirabelle, who is the uh, very... Uh, fashionable, beautiful one. Uh, and then there is Emily, who looks almost like the nun in training. I think I would try Maribel, just because my guess is that the nun in training is firmly attached to Dolores, and Maribel is the unknown quantity. Okay, uh, so you ask this of Maribel, and she looks surprised, like she hadn't thought of that. And she's like, "Oh, no, I'm I'm sorry, I I don't use those. I like think they have." Some... No, no, no. A pad's fine if you've got that. Or are you more of a cup person? Uh, this is rather personal. I I think they might have something in the bathroom. I'm sorry, I don't have anything. I make a comment as a doctor, bold as brass. I think we really should talk about more things like that. There really well, should be nothing shameful about it. I'm, I'm sorry, that's just not how I was brought up. I, sh I, should, I should go. And I find that super weird. And relay that to the group as another person to check out. With someone with good sleight of hand, is there anyone with good sleight of hand in our group who could try to thermal scan her surreptitiously? Uh, so, speaking of, we're going to call this uh, the end of the first hour. Uh, and so you rolled four more successes. So you All can right. examine four more people. All the people that were mentioned in the last scene, except for Fernando. Uh, so which four? Uh, the you were talking to the nun in training, right? No, I was talking to Mirabel. 
Okay, Mirabelle. Fas- highly fashionable woman who's incredibly coy and res- um, reserved. All right, about so my perfectly reasonable question. All right, Mirabelle, cold. So cold. This is not looking good. Oh, uh, you were muted, Lily. Luke. The, the half nun, I still think we should check. Uh, Lily, warm. The half, the nun in training. Uh, Emily, warm. I got one more. Oh, um. Oh, let's check out the CEO. Make sure the whole hospital isn't in on the vampire thing. <laughs> CEO. Warm. I'm telling you, she's Warm. a demon of green, all caps. All right. <laughs> So I relay in chat, Mirabelle, cold. So now we have three cold bodies. Dot, dot, dot. Maybe we're in over our head. Heads, question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, Texting, if we can take out one of their flunkies, then we could probably pull one of them away. Maybe if we tried dosing one of their drinks. Huh. Right, well, can't we just have Carl say, I'm security, I need you to come with me to Bert or the other uh, people that are flunkies? Yeah, I, I, I had an idea about that. Okay. Where would we group up to? Kitchen area, security area? Yeah, well, I, I'm sort of imagining there's like a storage room of some sort or like a uh, nurse's station that's not currently in use where you can have like quiet conversations. Yeah, if we could do that after I talk to Fernando because yes. potentially if we can, if I can convince him to uh, help us, uh, then that would be more effective. By all means. So, talk to him, see what's going on, and then what I can do is I can try to lure them by using the SUVs. I'll come up to them and say, oh, I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, is anyone here the owner of you know SUV X, Y, and Z? It's been uh, vandalized. Can you please come with me to the, can you please follow me so we can take a look at that and try to pull them out with this. All right, and so you're going to target Fernando with that? I'm going to try because we do know that they are the owners of one of the three SUVs. So they should react to it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so... Whoever I know is not cold will turn away. Mm-hmm. You make up some excuse like, oh, okay, perfectly fine. Uh, you know, we'll take care of that. But if we know whoever's following up and is cold, and if Bert follows up, we'll we'll target them straight out. All right. So uh, just make sure I've got the plan correct. You're gonna go to Fernando first and say, "Oh my oh, God, my- your car was well, vandalized." Yeah. Please no, no, come no, no. With us. Mandy's taking care of Fernando, right? Okay. She's having a chat with them first to see what's going on. Okay, and then what will you be doing? Depending on what's happening with the government agents, then we can follow through with trying to bait them and come out. Okay, all right. I mean, if the government agents are on it, we've got more bodies to be able to deal with, you know, the walking leashes. All right, so uh, Mandy, are you? Uh, how do you want this to go down? Uh, what is Mandy's position in the catering group? Uh, like, she works there regularly, so she would have more standing than Fernando in general. Um, so yeah. I guess I don't really need to know more than that. Um, she 
says, hey, Fernando, can you help me uh, get some more uh, champagne out of the back room? We're keeping it there to keep it cool. Oh, uh, 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 yeah, and sort of like, sort of awkwardly puts down the tray he's carrying, uh, and we'll follow you. Cool. Uh, I take him to a room that is not where they're keeping anything, uh, because she doesn't want anyone else to run in to what they're doing, and, uh, sort of somewhere behind the kitchens in private, and she sits down on like a box or a chair or whatever's in there and says, you might want to take off your shoes. I don't really think they're meant to be worn all night like this. Uh, so he looks down at his shoes and sort of laughs like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll um, make, a, make a better choice next time I, I gotta do something like I this, don't, you know? I don't really think that other accessory is meant to be worn all night either. Oh, uh, what do you mean? Your earpiece. Oh, yeah, that's just a hearing aid, he says, clearly lying. You're you're lying to me. I've spent so much of my life being flown, driven, shipped around, cleaning up the government's crap. I know a good earpiece when I see one. I know a government agent when I see one. He sort of looks you up and down, says, look, I don't know what you think you know, but there's a very delicate operation going down tonight. Yeah, there's three blank bodies. We know. So you say blank bodies and like his entire demeanor changes like, oh, fuck. (laughs) Ah, did you say we? Yeah, we're the local hunters around here. How many of them are you? I don't know. Are you going to help us? Or are you going to try to bitch slap us out of the way? Fuck, Flamingo, we got vigilantes. No, not vigilantes. We're being very careful about this whole thing. And you said two blank bodies. There's more than that here. Ah. All right, dude playing poker. And there's one we haven't caught yet. There's a dude playing poker, the nun, and the chick that looks like she walked out of a fashion magazine. Ah, fuck, I didn't want it to be her. All right, well... Oh, I do not need this. No, you clearly going on need vacation this. next week. You clearly need this if you couldn't figure that out on your own. All right, you shared information. All right, there's another one wandering around. We can't get eyes on it. So there's four of them. There's a wandering cold spot. Uh, She relays that in her group chat. I type in, are they also using our cameras? Rosie doesn't understand the question. I'm asking the um, government hunters, are they also using our cameras for surveillance? Because they said a wandering cold spot that they can't get a... um, Oh, you mean the hospital surveillance camera? Yeah, like have they tacked into our surveillance system? Uh, and another text. Uh, Luke is asking if they can, can we get the live information of that cold spot, where it is as it moves around the room? Yeah. I'll uh, go bump into it. Yeah. Um. So the... Fernando sees Mandy pull out her phone, quickly type something in, read something for a couple of seconds, glance back up and say, can you give us like a information on where that cold spot is 
in real time? It it keeps moving. So you don't we're know. We're trying. Do you know we're trying to get a beat on it. Have you tapped into the hospital security feeds? Yeah, we we've got. Uh, yeah. Yes, we've requisitioned the feeds. We've added in some of our own equipment, too. That's how we found the spot. Okay. Well, it, the banner that's flying around, that's how we've been scanning people's temperatures. So if you know, if you think there's someone that we that should be verified, we can try that. Carl is going to type, do these things react to external temperature? Do they get sweaty? Do they get hot? Do they get cold? Question. question mark, question mark, question mark. And uh, one of my buddies wants to know if, you know if these things get sweaty or cold like do they react to external temperatures i don't know what that one's about no not unless it's something uh hostile to life in general uh she types back only extremes so car will i will i'm going to beeline to temperature control and crank up the temperature whoever so, is not reacting to it That's who we're looking for. Question All mark. right, well. Should I? Question mark. You're pretty sure you know who your targets are now. Okay. I type in, do you want to temporarily expose one of us to try to use it as bait to see if we can lure one off to follow us? Which one? Which one of them do you think would be most likely to think they could handle which one of us? Well, we have the best feeling that Bert is connected to Micah, right? I say we go after the human connected to the vampire and hope that pulls the vampire with. Good idea. Yeah. Or we pressure the human to give us something on the vampire. Or take the human's phone and make it use their thumb to open it. If they have a phone. Uh, so, seeing that flurry of stuff going back and forth, Mandy looks up at Fernando and says, so what we're currently, what we're thinking of doing was trying to get uh, Bert away from Micah so that uh, Micah doesn't have their ghoul, uh, their human chew toy, whatever. And uh, then we can pressure Bert or at least remove that uh, aid. Uh, if we did that, would you be able to help us or leverage the situation? So he, so what happens is he just sort of like rubs his temples and like, oh god damn vigilantes, you're probably not going to go home, are you? Fuck no. There's innocent people here. And then what happens next is you hear a, a quick rapping on the door. And it opens and it reveals the demi nun. She says, Ah, oh, shit. You good in here? I mean, yeah, but I do you, do you need the room for something? So Fernando then says, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I found the vigilante. Uh, we're probably going to have to work with them. Oh, boo fucking who? All right. Look, vigilante, you get one night. One night of grace. Do not fuck this up. Yeah, okay. Next so, time, pick a better cover. You're really bad at catering. Let's just focus. All right, so you're gonna get the Dayminder, right? 
peel him off? Hope the black body comes with it? Yeah. Alright. <sighs> Fuck. Hang on. He leaves the little closet, goes to uh, where all the employees keep their bags and purses, uh, fishes out some equipment. How many of them are you? Do we still have um, Harry's character? He has somehow disappeared. Uh, there should be six of us, but one hasn't. And she's scrolling back to see like when the last time he sure. texted something. And like. you see the text from Luke saying, don't give them all the information. Don't fully trust them. Well, uh, like uh, five or six of us? I don't really, I don't know. Someone brought a friend. Good enough cover. <laughs> she tries to save it. That's about it. <laughs> All right, so are we doing this? Dot, dot, right. dot, question mark. <laughs> yep. So do I try to peel the uh, human slave to the vampire thingy somewhere? Question mark. Yeah. Luke votes yes. Thumbs up emoji. So you guys will be waiting for us. Uh, I'll follow behind. Like, I, when I see you and him leave, I will trail after. So I also see if the vampire is coming after. Okay. All right. So, here is what happens. Is Carl goes up to Bert, and I assume use the thing that you sort of worked out before, like, hey, your car has been vandalized. Do you want to... Yep. Yeah, so he looks to Micah, says, I'm going to all handle this, boss. Uh, gets up, follows you. Uh, and so, Luke, as you try to follow Carl and Bert, you are intercepted by Fernando, handing you a piece of technology, saying, here, put this on. And so these uh, are essentially little earpieces with sub-vocal mics. So very useful pieces of equipment. Okay. Thanks for trusting us, I guess. Okay, and that is the last anyone hears of Carl. <laughs> well, that's ominous. The, uh... <laughs> so. I think. Do darn it. We didn't agree to a code phrase for I think we've been made. Jillian sends a message. Where's Carl? He was doing the plan. He never came back. Yeah, and I was going to follow him, but I, I lost him, and then I, I tried to find him, and I, I couldn't. Plan B. Um, I try to knock my drink Accidentally on Micah. Okay. So it did it spill on him? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. And uh, he gets uh, very briefly angry, but like, no, you know what? It's it's just, just spilled liquor. Uh, God damn it. Where is Bert? All right. I'm going to go change oh, here, my shirt. Let, let me help you with that. And it's at that point in time, I take a Zippo lighter and I try to light that bitch up. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I see we are escalating. 
Awesome. I love it. All right. So go ahead and give me... Uh, this would probably be dexterity. Uh, and I would give you... Let's do either melee or stealth. Or larceny. Larceny is a good one. Two successes. Okay, did you roll any ones? No. Okay. Uh, so, you do manage to successfully set his shirt on fire. And you, and one or two people next to you, see, like, like, you remember how in the old Buffy TV shows, when the vampires let their nature come to the surface, it showed on their face? That's kind of like what just happened, what you just saw happen to Micah's face. It becomes, for the space of maybe four or five heartbeats, utterly inhuman. And he makes this noise that should not come from a human throat. And he runs out of the room. And he's going to head for the bathroom to try and extinguish himself as soon as possible. Am I closer to the nun or to the fleeing Mycos? Because there's two strategies I could do here, both of which involve picking up a tablecloth and running towards them as if I was about to try to put the fire out. Either I'm about to trip over a nun with a tablecloth hilariously and stake her, or I'm about to run into the men's washroom. So... Luke is going to the men's washroom because he has a flask of, like, grain alcohol that he's going to pour on the fire as opposed <laughs> to, like, here, let me help you put that out and try and make it worse. That's what, so if it helps any, Luke is going towards the back. I'm going to head to the washroom with the blanket and not throw it on him, but basically be second step behind you. You can flan the flames. <laughs> Actually, I was planning on, um, like, um, Hoping that my fire axe was nearby, but it can be tucked into like a serving cart that Mandy pointed out to you beforehand. Yeah, that and I may need to um, roofie one of the men in the washroom, which is probably the worst thing that'll ever happen to him at a urinal. Okay, quick question Would it be easier if while this is happening, Jillian has a a news, just a newspaper that has one of her articles from the whatever state soda newspaper, and she is just running, fanning this flame, like, oh, I am so sorry. Here, let me help you put it out, and I am just fanning, just trying to light this fucker up. Okay. All right. So forgive me, I, I was uh, a bit distracted uh, talking to someone else about tomorrow's game. So uh, you have uh, a very angry, thrown off his game vampire that you have successfully corralled into the men's bathroom. Uh, there's probably someone using it, just standing at the urinal, who looks over, sees what's going on, Decides they want no part of this. Zips back up and walks out with the like, didn't see nothing, didn't hear nothing attitude going on. Uh, so, right now Micah is very, very preoccupied with uh, extinguishing himself. And so, uh, in turn, are all four of you in here? Um. Alright, Mandy's no. too smart for this bullshit. Yes. Okay, but so Jillian, Luke, and Sultani, are you also here? Yeah, I am. I'm not. Jillian okay. is there. Uh, Dr. Sultani, are you here? Um, I at least... Actually, if multiple... Those two are running towards it, two would be enough. I think this is the point when I... Um, 
failed to put um, Micah out with a tablecloth and tackle the nun. All right, well, so Micah's in the bathroom right now. Yes. The, the nun is still at the party with a lot of eyes on her. That's why I was... Is this a plausible situation? Because if Jillian and... Okay, I'll go to the washroom. Makes it easier. Okay. Yeah, so essentially what has happened is Jillian has successfully separated Micah from the herd by forcing yes. him to need to use the bathroom. Everyone else is still in the same room. Uh, all right. So, uh, Luke, what are you doing to the vampire? Uh, he is on fire, and he's trying to put it out? Yes. I'm going to pour my highly flammable alcohol on him and just keep that fire going. Okay. Uh, and so, Dr. Sultani, what are you going to do? Um, he's on fire, so staking him would probably damage me. I'm going to make sure it's difficult for other people to get into the washroom because there's someone with a tablecloth who's willing to punch them out from behind the tablecloth. Okay. And kind Jillian. Like yes. Uh, basically, one of us needs to be watching the door so when the inevitable Bert or what have you comes to save the day, someone mm -hmm. can deal with them. I feel you two could be busy throwing, I don't know, paper towel on him. Okay, Jillian. I'm fanning the flame with my newspaper. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So, in that case, I would like either strength or dexterity. You can roll whichever one you have better. Uh, plus your brawl, please, both Luke and Jillian. Three successes, no ones. Uh, if I recall correctly, the desperation goes up when you hit uh, one of the points before, so I have two desperation dice now, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Are you adding the desperation dice? And, I mean, you might as well add them into your yeah, pool. They're it's all desperation yeah. dice now. Plus, I don't have a ton of dice otherwise. So... Okay. Uh, let's see. That's an eight. A zero. So that's two. Okay. Three successes. All right. So... Between the six successes that you have generated... You see something that even though you are reasonably aware of the occult, uh, you have never been up close and seen the rage on the face of a dying vampire. And he, you can see now in his eyes and his extended fangs and the way his skin is drawn over his skull all those little clues of this person is not human. Uh, and he looks to all three of you and just spits out. Uh, I have seen empires rise and fall I have crossed oceans. I will not die like this. And so, Mandy, while this is happening, what are you up to? Uh, other than watching in horror, uh, <laughs> uh, as uh, how how obvious is it that this man is on fire? Uh, if you are in the bathroom... Extremely. No, I mean, like, when he is set on fire. Oh, yeah, it's very easy to see, like, like little licks of flames and him freaking out. Okay. Um, then Mandy is going to spend, like, if anyone freaks out, just be like, it's okay, don't worry. Some of the other staff went after that person to make sure they're okay 
The hospital is a great burn ward if they need it. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> um, to try to stop civilians from following them. And um, if Fernando was glaring at her, I, I, she's like, that was not the plan. Um, but it worked, I'm sure. All right. So Fernando is going to try and follow into the bathroom. Are you going to try and stop him or go with him or? Oh, I'm, I'm going to just go to the bathroom. I'm going to watch the others. Okay. So, uh, round two, Fernando enters the bathroom and so starts swearing in Spanish, uh, and brings out this very complicated looking recording device, like a camera with a couple peripherals plugged in. And, uh... Jillian, give me high or low? Low. Alright. So I rolled a four, which means he's going to attack you. So, go ahead and give me a... Well, are you going to defend yourself or are you going to fight back? Is Micah still on fire? Yes, and he is trying to attack you. Okay, I'm going to dodge so he can bump okay. into him and both of them get set on fire. All right, so give me a dexterity uh, brawl, or not, a uh, dexterity athletics roll, please. Oh, fuck. No successes. All right, well, he botched. That's great. I rolled a three, a two, and two ones. Hooray. So, uh... A vampire in a frenzy is not thinking at their best, and so while he lashes out at you, uh, you just barely manage to go like, oh shit, uh, and get out of the way as he stumbles and continues burning. And I imagine this is the round where you finish him off. Oh yeah, who who whoever's closest to me, they're they're getting staked. Okay. So go ahead and give me uh, a dexterity plus melee roll, Jillian. Uh, and then Luke, uh, whatever attack roll you feel like making. And of course, Dr. Sultani, if you feel like getting in on this party, um, what you could do is potentially make it easier for Jillian to get the stake in. Um, you know, by, like, holding him down. Um, yes, and I could probably use the tablecloth for a little extra armor and still look like I'm trying to put him out, although I had been guarding the door mm -hmm. at the time, so when this dude came in and, um, uh, French, Franco, Francesco? Fernando. Fernando. Fernando, sorry. Fernando attacked Jillian, right? Yes. I think my first instinctual reaction, even if I could have assisted with this, probably would have been to try to throw the tablecloth over Fernando and rabbit punch him. <laughs> All right, go ahead and give me that roll. Hope uh, I'm not screwing things up for you. I don't have the best dice, so I feel like this is the situation where, like, can you choose to have some desperation dice? Yes. Uh, you can I feel like my dice. character's pretty desperate because things have gone terrible. I have one dot of brawl and two dots of strength or two dots of dexterity. Uh, yeah, this will be dex brawl. So three dice and then I can take a point of desperation to get a desperation die. Uh, essentially, you add your points of desperation into your pool. I have no points of desperation right now, though, so I just have three dice to work with. Uh, you have at least one, because you always have at least one. Oh, right! Okay, so that's gonna be a pool of four. Wish me luck. I will probably fail. And 
and I got two successes, no botches. Okay. Oh, sorry, three, because um, one of them was a ten. Oh, all right. Okay, so Fernando manages to duck out of the way of your attempt to rapid punch him. Uh, and we'll just say, federal agent, back off. All right, so Luke and Jillian, uh, I would like you both to give me an attack roll. And what I will say is that since you are working together, if between the two of you, you get the five successes necessary, you will have staked this vampire. Uh, 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 what, what did you want us to roll for the attack roll? Uh, since you are trying to slam the stake in, give me either strength or dexterity plus your melee. Oh, okay, that's what I rolled. Two successes. Okay. Uh, then what would I be able to roll? Would like a firearms roll help with that or would it have to also be a, a brawl roll from Luke? So... Let's say that you are holding the vampire down, and so that would be a strength roll, and I would allow you to use either athletics or brawl. Hmm. I might just try and take out my flare gun and shoot him with that. Okay. When in doubt, add more fire. It's it's the, the better option for what he is able to do successfully. I think. All right. Uh, Dex plus firearms in that case. I'm going to add my desperation dice. See how that works. Uh, Well, there was a one on the non desperation dice. They're all desperation dice. Oh, but they're all desperation dice. Oh, this was the second time, but okay. I thought that was only once, but yeah. Oh, uh, normally it would be, but uh, our lovely if audience they keep giving, who... And yeah, by all means, uh, exactly. I had a success, but uh, there there was a one. Okay. Successes do count. So, uh... Huh. All right, so... We are going to end this, I think, on a little bit of a cliffhanger. And so with your desperation, uh, we're going to say that what has happened is overreach. I think that's fair, given I poured alcohol on a burning vampire. Also, I will say in character, what are you doing, federal agent? You're attacking a human kill the vampire, not Jillian. So, with overreach, what happens is there is suddenly another person in this bathroom. Uh, It is looks possibly male, but it is the ugliest motherfucker you have ever seen wearing a very nice 1920s style tuxedo. Just one moment there's four of you in the van four of you in the bathroom, the next minute there's five. Then oh shit and starts heading towards the door. However, you have inflicted enough damage on this vampire to end it. And you watch all of you as not only does it die, but it crumbles to ash as the years, the many stolen years that this vampire lived catch up to it and as you're watching it decays in front of your face all the flesh 
and the skin and even the bones turning to dust and that's that's going to be some explaining that you're going to have to do in about five minutes when Emily and the rest of the Second Inquisition crash in demanding to know what you've done but that is a story for our next fundraiser game because unfortunately we have reached time but you have successfully accomplished your goal there is one less vampire in the city This tale has drawn to a close, but we have 11 more left to tell over the course of this fundraiser. Thank you so much to our generous audience. You have brought us... That is not what I wanted to click on. You have brought us to $329. Uh, thank you so, so much for all of that. Uh, our next... Uh... Our next milestone will be for viewers uh, randomly selected getting to play in a short game run by Zach Rules. Uh, another lucky viewer will get two copies of the Love Your Rebellion zine. Tomorrow, we return to the same time slot to tell a story of bedlam and banality as Ambrose guides us through a one shot of Changeling the Dreaming. I will be there. I will be a slua. I can't wait. Hunters. Please, in the normal order, tell everyone who you are and when they can see you next. And while you do that, I will do our random drawing because one lucky person from the chat will receive a copy of Mason. Hi, everybody. Kitty Kimchi here. And today I was Jillian, um, your um, lighted up journalist. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Yep, She's Blasian. And next Tuesday, um, you can catch me on ATL by Night. So check me out. Hey there. I was playing Dr. Sultani on Panda, otherwise known as Bevels, on various social media. And you can find me tomorrow night playing a knocker. And hello, I am Rosie, regular size mom. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at mom underscore size or on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Etsy as Odd Duck Dice. My dice are all currently 40% off in celebration of Gen Con, so check it out. Uh, and tonight I have been playing Mandy Clements for you, uh, your retired army vet hunter caterer. Successful business owner. Richer than the doctor. <laughs> well, this has been a blast. Uh, I am at House Tremere. You can find me on Twitter. Um, I'm not sure the next time I'll have a streaming thing you can see me on, but I'll post if I do. Um, but I have been Luke Aronson, a uh, celebrity who found vampires and decided he didn't much like them. I kind of think that's how all of us would feel, right? You, you want to know something fun? The nun was Tremere. Oh. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> so, uh, Lupine Vendetta, come on down. You have won a free copy of Vason. Please DM Eldritch Echoes on Discord to redeem your prize. So, I've been your storyteller. My name is Rachel, and you can find me as Stolen Fires pretty much everywhere on the internet. I will be appearing tomorrow in Ambrose's Changeling game, and then again on the 7th for Demon the Fallen. The day after that, you will find me running Night Witches, a Powered by the Apocalypse game about female Soviet Air Force pilots who bombed the hell out of some Nazis. Once again, we would like to give a very special thanks to Dark Somnium Music, Sapphic, Travis Savoy, Epidemic Sound, Aim to Head Official, 
Helm Guest, Free League, and Eldritch Echoes for providing all the music you heard tonight and will hear over the next 11 days of charity events. Thank you again to Roll20 for providing the excellent virtual platform. And last but not least, a heartfelt thanks to you, our Ride and Die listeners and fans, for both tuning in and experiencing the story with us. And a special thanks to everyone who donated. So, stay in the shade, stay hydrated, and good night. <laughs>